and welcome to our lecture on daily life in ancient Egypt. And let's start with the basics, which is to say, since we'll be talking often about value or payments, let's have a talk about currency in ancient Egypt, or rather the lack thereof. They did not have coins, they did not have any means of currency the way we understand it today. What they did have was a system of equivalent value, which is to say that it was based on a certain weight in copper called the Debin. In the New Kingdom, this was 91 grams of copper. Um, as you can see, over time, they had various weights to measure that. However, people did not get paid in copper or did not pay in copper. Instead, this was used as a way of measuring the worth of things. Here you can see the monthly wages for workers in Deir el-Medina in the New Kingdom. And the worker receiving 11 Deben would not have received it in copper, but in grain. Um, but he would have received the equivalent in grain to 11 Deben of copper. And this was very useful, for example, when you went to the market, because the ancient Egyptian economy was a barter economy, which means that you would be exchanging objects for other objects. Um, you would be exchanging the grain you got as your wages in order to buy other foodstuffs or clothing or whatever else you might need. But to make sure that the exchange was equivalent or near to equivalent, Knowing the value of the various objects in Deben allowed you to know if you were being cheated or try to cheat other people. <laughs> now that we've established that, um, we can have a little bit of a look at various commodities and what they were worth in the 20th dynasty. Um, as you can see, some things could vary greatly. Um, for example, a mirror could vary depending on what it was made of from six to 100 deben. So you could buy a very simple mirror for six deben or you could splurge for one with gold leaf or whatever else you wanted for 100. Um, as you can see, food stuff was mostly fairly cheap, but when you think of the fact that a worker only had 11 deben, you can see that um, life could also be very hard. Assuming you have enough money for it, or you fell in love, let's start our journey through daily life in ancient Egypt with affairs of the heart. Um, courting seems to have been very similar to modern courting. Um, we know that lovers went on picnics, that they gave each other gifts. We have a number of love poems from ancient Egypt that are full of pining and wishes to see their loved ones and how ill you feel when you don't see them for a few days. Um, jealousy and everything that belongs to an exciting courtship. What we do have, we obviously homosexuality existed in ancient Egypt. We do have certain um, hints of it, mostly in religious texts, where it's portrayed mostly in a negative light, unfortunately. However, we do have this very interesting tomb of Niang Shnum and Shnum Hotep that shows two men embracing. Um, the problem is we don't exactly know if why they're embracing. Um, there's a parallel theory that these are twins. Um, there are some things that speak in their favor. One is the fact that the names both are very similar, both having the name of the god Hnum in it. Um, both were married. This could have been due to societal norms and less to do with um, sexual orientation. Um, and actually the fact that they are embracing and kissing may in fact rather, because ancient Egypt, in ancient Egypt, it was very rare to show people actually kissing. So to have that shown in a tomb might be to show that they were very close, say in a mother's room, rather than showing a romantic love. However, it could equally show that we have here a very close homosexual or bisexual couple who decided to build their tombs right next to each other um, in a sort of double tomb and show their love in relief. 
Of course, not every love affair went smoothly. Um, we have several instances where we know that there was trouble in paradise. One is here in our museum. It's a very lovely letter from a man called Hotep to his lady love, Iporesti, telling her that she shouldn't listen to all those rumors about another woman and that he's sending her raisins, uh, a bundle of onions, and some grain. Nowadays, we would expect him to appear at her doorstep with a bunch of flowers and a box of chocolates. And we also have a very interesting letter from a man called Hekanacht to his family. Hekanacht was chiding his family for not treating his new wife very well, um, saying that they were keeping her socially isolated and that they should stop and treat her properly. How exactly did you get married in ancient Egypt? Well, it was actually very simple. You decided you loved each other, you moved in together, and generally it was expected that you gave a banquet. Once you started living together, you were considered a married couple, and sexual relations outside of that household was considered cheating. It was common, at least for families that were financially stable, for the earner, generally the man, to play a sort of pin money or salary to not only the servants in his household, but also to the family members, so that they had a certain amount of financial independence. So here we can see we have the Heikanacht household, including his second wife, Hetepet, who received 0.8 sacks of barley. Um, what's unclear is if it's per day, but most probably these things are per month, at least for um, salaries of dependents. Um, we see that his eldest sons from his previous marriages received money, his daughters from his first marriage, they're probably younger and therefore receiving less. And his very youngest daughter is very probably um, still extremely young, so that she re only receives 0.2 sacks of barley. There was an intention um, to make sure that family members had a certain amount of financial independence. However, some things are not meant to last. Divorce was possible in ancient Egypt. Various grounds would be adultery, um, could be incompatibility, um, or lack of love. And all these were considered acceptable reasons to file for divorce. This could come from the man or the woman. The phrase is very simple, should be spoken in front of witnesses. We have... Um, instances in which this was also written down in a kind of divorce contract. And the phrase is simply, I abandon you and you are free to marry again, which suggests that both divorce and remarriage were not considered socially unacceptable. Um, <clears throat> women, if they didn't have property of their own, received one third of the husband's property. Uh, however, if she left him and she had brought a dowry to the household, she was expected to leave some of that dowry with her husband when she left. Now, assuming everything is going well and you're having a very interesting and um, fulfilled mar marital life, um, you will, of course, be having sex. Um, the ancient Egyptians did not often talk about it or show it. However, we do have this very interesting papyrus here that gives us some idea together with some medical texts about how contraceptives would work. Now, if you look here, you can see that a woman is, it's unfortunately rather destroyed, but if you look carefully, you will see that there's a woman here who is putting on makeup. Her legs are spread over a interesting conical device. This is a very probably a, um, either a type of fumigation or a tampon that would have been inserted to prevent conception. Um, there are various recipes for the tampons that include things like crocodile dung, which may or may not be actual crocodile dung or a plant named crocodile dung. We're not quite sure about that. Um, but one of the leading um, ingredients is acacia gum. And when fermented, this may have changed the pH of the vagina enough to have formed a fairly effective contraceptive. But assuming you did want children, 
And this was something that in ancient Egypt was a positive thing. Um, Stila show new, uh, families with numerous children. We saw that Hekanakt uh, also had a number of children from both marriages. Um, a woman would have received a certain amount of prenatal care depending on her social status, how much she could afford. Um, we do know there were gyne gynecologists, there were doctors that were specialized in women's troubles. We do know that there were doulas or midwives, um, though those seem to have mostly come during the moment of the birth. Prenatal care mostly seems to boil down to go outside a lot and eat well, which is very good advice. You get a lot of vitamin D and from the sunlight and um, everybody knows that a good nutrition is very important. We don't have a lot of information on prenatal care from a medicinal point of view. What we do have is some recipes to accelerate labor, most probably when the woman is overdue or is having trouble with her contractions. Um, what we also don't have is any evidence for surgical births. Now, we do know that um, tears were, would have been repaired with sutures, but um, there is no evidence, for example, for a cesarean section. How exactly the birth took place? Um, we do know that something called birth breaks played an important role. However, what we're not sure of is exactly what role. Um, here on the right, you can see a birth brick from Abydos. It has a very nice depiction of a woman holding her newborn child in her arms. Um, they may have been used similar to the image on the left, which was used in Persia uh, until, I was going to say fairly recently, but I'm a historian, 19th century is quite some time ago, um, for a crouching position, which is actually a very good birthing position, um, is very beneficial for the birth canal. Or it may have been placed around the birthing woman for a purely magical protection. Um, or there is some evidence that the newborn child was placed upon them also either for the postnatal exam or as a form of magical protection again. Um, Evidence for crouching during birth is fairly rare. We see it here. This is in Dendera. This is a, a very late example. Most examples show the birthing woman either sitting on a chair or on a bed. Um, here we do have her crouching. And most of the texts that mention birth mention either a mat or a bed. So it seems that some form of sitting uh, half seated or lying down would have been the preferred birthing position. The midwives are uh, shown and described as being behind, so holding her up in some way and in front, obviously, to manipulate the baby. And hopefully, if everything goes well, you have a happy mother and child. And we have a number of depictions of so-called arbors, that uh, show a woman nursing either on a bed that would have had depictions of Bess or Tauret. Those are protective deities for mother and child. Um, on the left, she's sitting on a seat. Um, she's shown being attended to by women who bring her mirrors or are doing her hair. And it seems to be a very light construction with a lot of vines and plants that decorate it. Um, this suggests that a certain amount of time was left for the woman to recover from the birth and where family members or domestics would have taken care of her and given her some time to bond with her baby. However, not everybody can nurse all the time. Nursing uh, seems to have been for about three years generally, um, but either when you're on the road or for uh, if you have to leave your baby for a little while, we do have evidence that milk was express, expressed and stored in bottles. We have a number of bottles, like the one on the left, showing a mother and nursing child. Um, we also know that 
the breast milk of mothers, especially those that had given birth to sons, were used in certain medicines. So if you had some to spare, you could always sell it. Um, and on the right, we have something wonderful. This is either for giving medicine or maybe for giving small amounts of milk to a nursing baby. It's a little nursing cup and it's decorated with little protective demons. Um, of course, if you could afford it and you didn't want to nurse yourself, you could retain the services of a wet nurse. We have wet nurse contracts from the Greco-Roman period, and we know the names of several royal wet nurses. For example, Maya, who was a wet nurse of Tutankhamun. Um, we know the name of Nefertiti's wet nurse, even though we don't actually know the exact name of her parents. Of course, you would want to take your child with you when you can, and a very simple carrying sling was used for that. Um, in Egypt, the child seems to have been held in front, and we know from other depictions that in Nubia, for example, it might have been carried on the back. Growing up, the child, of course, would love to play. We have evidence for a number of games that don't require any toys, um, simple games that are shown on the walls of tombs, um, running games, spinning games, jumping games, uh, balls, of course, existed. Here they are made out of um, palm leaves. But we also have evidence for a number of toys. My favorite are all the ones where the mouth opens. We have a fair number of them, including a lion, a dog, and a crocodile. Um, here from the greco roman period, we have some dancing figures. You could move a little lever and they would dance around. Uh, board games were enjoyed by adults as well, and we also have a number of them that have survived from ancient Egypt. If you could afford it, because there is um, circumstantial evidence that you did have to pay for schooling, one. Two, of course, uh, poorer people would have needed their children to participate in earning money or just toiling the fields or helping out at home, then you might go to school. We're not entirely certain where the schools were. We do know there was a temple school and there was a palace school. Most likely, smaller temples might have offered some sort of schooling service. We do have remains of educational materials that suggest that a school was somewhere near, for example, near the Ramesseum the uh, funerary temple of um, Ramses II. We do know there was some sort of school there because we have found the materials for the children, but we're not sure exactly in what room it is. It is also entirely possible that um, school was mostly outside and moved from place to place. Schooling involved learning to read and write, <clears throat> mostly hieratic or demotic. Those are the cursive scripts of ancient Egypt. Here on the right, we see somebody practicing hieroglyphs. On the top, you see what his teacher had made and the student's attempt to copy it. Um, as you can see, he's probably just starting out. Most people would not have learned the hieroglyphs. This was for draftsmen and the higher level scribes, people who were meant for the administration, um, who might have wanted to know what was written exactly on the tombs, and of course, the priests who worked in the temples. Um, there's some evidence that some schools at least taught foreign languages because we have lists, uh, some vocabulary lists. We know that mathematics were taught because we have the books with the, all the math exercises in them. Um, we also have some vocabulary lists that suggest a certain general knowledge of geography. There was no general curriculum but there were some things that we do know were taught all through Egypt. There are some standardized tests like the Kemet um, and certain literary texts that were used throughout Egypt. Um, this was a bit the equivalent of our modern Shakespeare or Catcher in the Rye or all the classics that were taught, except that these classics were also used to teach grammar and style because the students had to copy the texts to get to know them better. School probably lasted four to five years, 
after which you would probably go either to um, go on to be a lower level scribe or go on to some sort of specialized apprenticeship. Apprenticeships, of course, existed for professions that did not require reading and writing. And very often those pr professions took place, uh, were passed on within the same family. We know that, for example, from Dera Medina, or here you can see that a mother is uh, baking while her child helps, hinders, and would probably have learned to become a baker in this way. Um, younger chi children on the field would have worked very early to the best of their abilities. Here on the bottom, you can see them gleaning, gleaning the grain that has fallen down from the sickles. From our own statue of Beken Khonsu, we do know that even higher level or higher society children could go on an apprenticeship. He mentions four to five years at school and then four to five years as an apprentice in the royal stables before he went on to a higher education, which is not the way it was today. He goes to the temple school where he learns everything he needs to know to become a priest, which is basically another form of apprenticeship, but because it has to do with um, learning texts and probably getting a better knowledge of the language, becoming more literate um, is a bit more equivalent to our college than any other higher level education someone would have received. If you didn't know how to read and write, you were a scribe, you were a valued member of society. However, uh, the lower level scribes did not earn that much more than a high level artisan. Um, I think it was half a sack of grain for the lower level scribes in Daryl Medina. However, if you had gone on and say apprenticed with in the administration, you had a chance to rise to the very highest levels of Egyptian society. Here you can see there is a scribal office and some of the tools of the scribes, including a palette for writing. You would have put your reed pens in there and you have um, black and red ink for writing. Uh, the one on the top is a little holder for papyrus rolls. They did not have weekends the way we do, nor really rest days in clearly defined intervals. However, by observing the various feast days that existed in ancient Egypt, Egyptologists have come to the conclusion that about every 10 to 15 days, there would have been rest days due to the feast of some local god or some greater god that would have allowed workers to have one to five days off at a time. Um, leaves of absences were common, they were noted. And here you can see a list of various reasons people took off work, a few entirely without reason. Uh, night out with friends apparently was a legitimate reason not to appear for work. Um, helping your colleagues, Various illnesses, obviously, scorpion bites, um, mourning, much what you would expect people to take off work for even today. Now you have received your payment, which was mostly going to be grain, and you have exchanged your grain for various other foodstuffs. You will want to preserve it. The climate in Egypt is hot. This has its advantages and also its disadvantage. A great disadvantage, of course, is that meat will spoil very quickly. Fish was mostly salted or pickled. And you can see from our relief here, from our museum, that the fish were taken out, were opened up, and then salted, much as they are even today. Uh, among meat and poultry, we have found various methods of conservation because fortunately they were given, pieces of meat were given in the tomb or were set in the tomb um, for the afterlife. So we can analyze them and know exactly how they were preserved. And these included drying, salting, smoking, or pemmicaning, which is a method of preservation using fat. Fruits, nuts, and vegetables would have been dried mostly. 
They had access to a very wide variety of things. Um, out of fruits, you can also make a number of um, alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverages. Wine was very common in Egypt. As you can see, the wine would have needed to be siphoned. These siphons have a small sieve inside. Um, the wine was probably very thick and um, this was a method of straining. This would have been done shortly before drinking. Baking. Bread and beer were the staples of the ancient Egyptian diet, in part because one was paid in grain. One could make these things at home. Um, as we can see, there are a whole variety of breads. These all come from the tomb of Ka, and you can see them in Turin. And what's interesting is that we can make, see the making and preparing of many of these types of bread in the funerary temple of Ramses III. Um, there are various breads shaped as animals or animal heads. There are flatbreads, there are loaves. Um, you can see that some of the flatbreads even have a sort of yeah, pinched area or a handle to make it easier to scoop up stew, for example, um, as they didn't have any eating utensils. And we can see that some of the bread was probably fried or boiled, and some of it was made in ovens. Beer was mostly made for barley, however, unlike our beer, they did not add any hops. Date juice was a way to help accelerate the fermentation process, so it would also have been a bit sweeter than ours. Beer houses would have provided beer outside the home, as well as various forms of adult entertainment. Food would have been stored in jars or in baskets, depending on the food. We can still see here, here the jar was cut away to show what was inside, like a type of pickled duck, and would have been closed with um, mud, dried mud, um, closed up with either strands of papyrus or palm leaf or a piece of linen. Uh, some of the better homes in Deir el-Medina also had a kind of cool cellar where you can keep things cool, um, a bit like an old-fashioned refrigerator. Cooking took place on open fires. Um, most cooking took place outside of houses. Some very rich houses would have had an extra little house for cooking that would have been separate from the actual house uh, where people lived, um, obviously because of the risk of things catching fire. Um, it's mostly a low fire directly on the ground with various grills and implements here for roasting, for example. However, we do have raised fires. This is actually from a boat. There was a kitchen boat among the models of Meket Ray that are now at the Metropolitan Museum. And you can see they have a little stove with a cooking pot on top. Here we see other various ways of cooking. Here people are preparing a tiger nut sweet, and they're using various tables. And here we see another of the little stoves where they are melting honey and mixing the dough. Meals, um, for the most part, were taken sitting on mats on the ground with either a very low table or another mat holding the food. However, if you were of a high enough, um, if you were rich enough, you would have enough chairs for people to sit on and enough high tables for people to eat from. However, even there, it seems to have been common for several people to share one platter or one tray. We have talked of the houses. The houses were made of mud brick. This is a absolutely wonderful um, construction material. I have spent time in mud brick houses in Egypt where it was 30 degrees Celsius outside and inside because I was sitting and drawing I had to put on a cardigan. They stay wonderfully cool. We also see that they have very high and um, very small windows that would cat or and here some a wind catcher that would catch the north wind and cool down the house further. The houses of the rich would have had an intended garden with an open pond or lake. 
which would have further cooled down the area around them. Additional shade and coolness would have been provided by trees, which would also have provided them with fruit. Normal houses were also made of mud brick. Uh, the more money you had, the more rooms you had. Very, very poor people would have had maybe one room. Um, here we have some houses from Dar el Medina, where we see that there was a series of rooms. Some of the rooms would have been multi-purpose, meaning that you would have rolled out mats in the evening to sleep on and then rolled them up during the day and lived in the same room. The richer you are, the more rooms you can have, the more you can have rooms with a very special purpose. How did you bring light into these rooms? Well, for once, you did have windows, but they would have been very high up and fairly small. Often they would have had a grill to prevent too much direct sunlight from coming in, which would have warmed up your house. However, you did have lamps. They could have been very simple uh, lamps like the ones you have on the right. They would have been filled most probably with goose fat uh, or beef tallow. And you would have lighted them with a wooden lighter. You have two different types of wood, a hardwood and a somewhat softer wood. And with the help of a bow, you would have um, rubbed them against each other until you could light your fire. Um, there are various lampstands in case you needed your illumination a bit higher up. To sit down, um, as I have said, very often you sat on the ground, and even if you did sit on stools, they tend to be very low. Basically, the higher up you sit, the higher your social status, but even people with a high social status would often sit on fairly low stools. Crouching was simply part of the Egyptian culture. But as you can see, you also had folding stools, for when you were on the road. You had chairs, both high and low, and chair coverings. Um, a lot of the chairs had um, a woven seat made of palm fronds, for example, or papyrus. Tables and stands were not particularly common but existed here, we have a low offering table. We have seen um, various serving platters for food that resemble that. Um, these are made of stone and were found in tombs. The originals might have been made of wood. We also have stands for various things, including our pots, which very often had a pointed bottom. These could have been either set into the ground if necessary, as the ground was generally only hard packed earth but you could also have them on various um, smaller stands. The higher ones would have allowed uh, air to circulate around your water jars, for example, which would also have helped them keep cool. Storage, we have seen baskets, we have seen jars, mostly for food and drink, and for anything else, like your clothes and jewelry, you would have had a number of caskets made either out of reed or out of wood. And these would have been either inlaid or painted or left simple, depending on what it is. We even have a lovely little toolbox here with a list of the tools that are inside. If you want, you can pause and look at the actual list. When you carry things, they did occasionally carry on their heads, but very often we see the larger things being carried on the shoulder, or you had these very practical carrying poles, either for one person or for several people which was used to carry things in baskets, things like trees. This is a very small incense tree. Or you could string your dried meat or your catch from fishing on them as well. Sleeping was also done on mats in the most simple households. You would have rolled out your mat whenever it was time to sleep, rolled it up again. As we can see, we have thinner mats, we have thicker mats. Um, you can also see some brooms. They only had short handle brooms, no long handle brooms, which means that sweeping was a very back breaking exercise. And this right here is the ancient Egyptian equivalent of a pillow. They're actually not as uncomfortable as they look. I have tried them out. 
They're not for sleeping on your back. They're for sleeping on your side. And there they are actually fairly comfortable. And as long as you're not too agitated a sleeper, they will keep your head high um, away from various animals that might want to nest in it. Um, the, they also don't have the disadvantage that pillows would have had in rooms that are near the ground where things such as snakes and scorpions would have been looking for your body heat or the heat of the cushion you are sleeping on. If you can afford it, your, bears, your beds were raised off the floor. And this is not the headboard, this is the footboard. We know this because the beds were set up in some of the tombs with the headrest right here. Uh, this is a bed again from the tomb of Ka, now in Turin, and they came with their blankets on it, as the nights in Egypt could be very cool. There is even a camping bed found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. It is folding, it could fold up, could be brought to another place, for example, when you're on a military campaign, or if you're traveling through Egypt so that you always have a bed on your ship. To get clean, the most common method was to have a basin and ewer. Um, they are found in a lot of tombs depicted in them, but from Amarna, the city of Amarna, we have remains of shower stalls. They have a groove that would let the water remove, uh, evacuate. Uh, here we have a big storage jar set into the ground, either for the evacuated water, which would have required some kind of pipe, or simply as a means to store the water. Uh, the thing about these showers is that you do need servants to pour the water over your head. They are also in some of the little tiny waiting palaces that are adjacent to some temples as a means of purifying before entering the temple proper. Yes, we did have latrines in a normal house that does not have a whole number of rooms. You might have simply a stool in which you could, with a hole in it, and you could place a jar underneath, maybe filled with scented sand. Or you could have as part of your showering arrangement, as here in Amarna, here you have the shower, and you have a little nook where a toilet seat such as this one would have also been put over a large jar. Of course, you don't need to be clean, only need to be clean, you also need to be pretty. Um, we have a number of cosmetic boxes, very elaborate such as these, or simply baskets filled with cosmetic articles. These include ungut jars, which would have been scented. Um, these both work as a cream and as a perfume, and a number of various uh, spoons and open areas where you can sort of mix your own or keep things handy for when you just need a quick dab. This is a mirror. It would have been polished. Uh, most of them are made of copper or bronze. Some of them are made of silver. And when polished as much as it goes, you can see yourself very well, even if it is not quite as clear as our modern mirrors. It is quite enough to be able to put on makeup. Makeup would have been applied with these applicators that you see here. Um, here you see a woman applying lip, something to her lips, a kind of lipstick. Um, otherwise, we do know that the eyes were often um, surrounded by coal. And we do know that a green eye makeup made of malachite was used. So here we have a number of little storage containers for coal or malachite. Another thing that you would have worn on special occasions is a wax cone filled with perfume, which would have melted over the course of the evening at a party and which would have added to the nice atmosphere, added sense to the atmosphere. And one of these have even, has even been found, which is how we knew that they were not fat as originally thought, but made of wax. Hair care, if you look at any of the statues uh, from ancient Egypt, you know that at least the upper class had very elaborate hairdos. These were very often wigs. 
And of course, you had to keep these wigs curled. This is a curling iron. You would have um, heated it up over a lamp and then wrapped either your wig hair or your hair around it. We have tweezers for removing hair in uncomfortable places. We have razors for your beard or your head. If you are wearing a wig, you would probably have kept your hair very short or shaved it off entirely. There are various ways to decorate your wigs, um, some more elaborate than others. And clothing was usually very simple in its cut. Um, here we have underwear. This is works a bit like a triangular um, nappy. Um, in the Old Kingdom, women had sheath dresses with um, straps. Though interestingly enough, most of those that have survived have sleeves, which are never depicted. Um, so it's assumed that they were removable, so that if it's a bit cooler, you would have the sleeves on, and when it got warmer, you could take them off. And as you can see, there's a separate part here that would have been that would have been the straps that you see here on this depiction. In the New Kingdom, things become more elaborate. Women. Uh, Men generally wore kilts, which would have been long, just <clears throat> long pieces of cloth that would have been wrapped around. In the New Kingdom, these become very pleated, um, that could actually either be woven in or added under the belt as you wrapped it. And women get wraparound dresses that are basically the same. They're very long. Um, bolts of cloth that would have been wound around the body to form the elaborate dresses that you see. In the New Kingdom, also new, instead of being bare-chested, men are often depicted wearing a tunic or shirt. That concludes our very superficial overview of daily life in ancient Egypt. I hope you had, um, I hope it gave you insight in what the lives of ancient Egyptians were like. And to take a little bit of it home, here's a recipe for tiger nut sweets as taken from the walls of the tomb of Rehmire. And I wish you a good day and thank you for listening.